ranin mugame rasipadir sugame ranin mugame rasipadir sugame uranani labo punnagai mararo uranani labo punnagai mararo alagire varitte amura Javin par verani in pakkam kanti du te sarkam kai muru te vetkam pon malai mayakam ராஜாவின் பார்வை ராணியின் பக்கம் கை மூடு வெட்கம் மயக்கம் On this sipping rock, very close to Munar, uh, we see two interesting species. We see this erect plant, which is a member of the Gesneriaceae, it's a Rhynchoglossum, Rhynchoglossum notonianum. Here we see some beautiful flowers. We see the inflorescence, uh, which is a scorpioid cyme, and the beautiful flowers with a huge uh, purple labellum uh, with a yellow spot inside. It's not usual in the family Gesneriaceae to have this kind of flower with uh, so asymmetric, so I mean very small lobes and huge central hanging lobe. What is characteristic also in the genus Rhynchoglossum, it has very few species, is the very strong asymmetry of the leaves. We see on each side of the midrib there is a very large lob of the leaf and on the other side much reduced and most important beginning much higher along the midrib. So here on this uh, sipping rock, just uh, below the tall Rhynchoglossum, tall but actually it's an annual species, it will die after setting all the seeds, all the fruits. We see the very succulent stem, same as many impatiens or begonia. And just under, much smaller, 
we see clearly this uh, carpeting impatience, a small species carpeting with very beautiful bright pink flowers. And this one probably is not at all annual because it is growing on the rocks and producing regularly new adventitious roots. So it has no reason to die in a short uh, time, in few months. And uh, it is branching and always erect, but never more than about 15 centimeters. The shape of uh, the lower petal is absolutely perfect. The two, the two petals are absolutely well designed with a small dot, bright pink dot in the middle, just below the upper petal. We see the very thick succulent stem of uh, this Rhinchoglossum, but in spite of being very vigorous, it is an annual species which will die after producing the seeds. And we see that nothing is created about lignified tissues, it's only a kind of hydrostatic skeleton. I mean the skeleton of the plant which is totally due to the cells, totally filled with water, due so, to some mucilaginous uh, uh, substance in the cells and in the vacuoles, the huge vacuoles inside the cell, allow the water to be totally concentrated. And when you make a dry herbarium specimen, this huge stem becomes <laughs> like a, a small paper because uh, there is only water inside and not at all uh, lignified tissues. So under this uh, rock, we see the tiny seedling of the Rhinchorosum. When I say tiny, we see that actually it is only about one centimeter long. And actually, this group of Gestariaceae have two cotyledons but one of the cotyledons is increasing and creates a first foliage leaf and just opposite a half millimeter small green thing which is a second cotyledon which remains always a tiny thing like this. And of course after this first big cotyledon the stem will arise from the middle. So this uh, lobelia, we see here a stem which is flowering and we see that all the leaves are dying now. So obviously the stem is monocarpic in the sense that it will die after flowering. But contrary to many other species of lobelia of East Africa, for instance, this one is globally not monocarpic because we clearly see at the base that new shoots are arising. But maybe also it's because this one is on a very, very steep slope. So in this case, of course, light is coming from the top part and it's uh, obviously much better to have the development of new shoots because the light is totally reaching the base of the older shoots. So in this case, we see that this lobelia is not monocarpic at all, maybe mostly because it is on an almost vertical slope. Another much younger here, and we see the small flowers typical of lobelia, with uh, one part which is uh, much more developed.
these uh, flowers of uh, lobelia very strange with the two part lateral parts which are almost detached from the main lobe of the corolla and with opening on each side so it creates a kind of lace work very very elegant so I have to check if there are many species of lobelia like this or if it's the same but this individual is quite small compared to many others so uh, maybe it's another species So on uh, this uh, young uh, growing stem, we see clearly the base of the leaves, which is really pink, uh, a little bit same as Lobelia gibberoa from the mountains of East Africa. And we see the very prominent vines on the lower side and all along the margin, we see small whitish dots, which are the hydatodes excreting water in these very humid habitats. In this uh, Shola forest uh, remnant, it's uh, just a patch uh, which is perturbated, of course, because in the understory there are many cardamom which are cultivated. But in spite of that, we see that the trees are covered by lichens and many also angiosperm epiphytes, ferns also. And we see quite a good diversity of the trees. And for instance, the tree with the terminal pink inflorescence. I'm a little bit far, but I really think that it's a Vernonia, and I think uh, here in Western Ghats there is Vernonia arborea, which is, of course, a tree. Oh la la, yes, and here it seems to be bright red, pinkish red flowers, but actually it's obviously new leaves of a tree. So I'll go closer to try to see which family it could be. We see that uh, this tree actually, the red elements are the leaflets of a compound leaf, compound leaf with about uh, three or four pairs of leaflets and they are totally bright red. So probably it's a member of a Meliaceae or maybe Sapendaceae, this group of families. Yes, under this uh, tree trunk, we see mosses, of course. We see some ferns, which are a little bit dehydrated, and an orchid covering totally the trunk. And I don't see the flowers, but we clearly see the structure of an orchid with the base, the pseudo-bulbous base everywhere. This Eritrina is a little bit strange about the shape of the flowers. So we see that uh, the flowers are condensed at the top of the branches, but actually it's uh, difficult to see the exact uh, structure of the uh, Fabaceae family. From far it looks a little bit like an orange daisy, but of course it's not at all the same family and the leaves are typical three foliolate leaves. Yeah. 
If you check on this uh, trunk, uh, the base of the trunk, we see the very smooth and uh, totally with no form, no shape at all, these hanging stems of a member of the Urticaceae, the genus Procris, and we see all the scars of the previous leaves, and we see at the end of the stems there are still some leaves of this Urticaceae. So, now it is very dry, but it will be okay when the rain will come again during the monsoon in about three or four months. All the stems will collect the water and will become turgescent and much more erect. Probably all these leaves will disappear within one or two months, but the plant will not die because we see clearly that the base is very thick. It's an old story. Oh, what is this? It's oh, an old inflorescence of this Aracée is still here. Okay, so it's a Remusatia. It has a small tuber which is fixed in the mosses. So we see one orchid, the Remusatia. This uh, Procris here, a small Peperomia also. So now is a dry season. We can imagine what happens during the monsoon seasons with all the dormant species and the annual species, so maybe there are some epiphytic impatience, for instance, and many other things. Here we see the stems emerging from the swollen, more or less tuberous base of this procris. So even in case of very dry season, even if the stems disappear totally, from this kind of a rootstock, rhizome or tuber, we don't know which word, no problem, the plant knows that it will be able to have some new emerging shoots from this base. On this erect stem, we can see the bulbils with the hooks just at the extremities. These hooks actually are totally reduced catafils and since they can be fixed on the hairs of animals it is a good way for dispersal. All along this mossy tree trunk, uh, we can see totally uppressed to the trunk a climbing Esculentus. Uh, it's a member of the Gesneriaceae and uh, this species is very well branched and the leaves are very, very thick. They are perfectly adapted to this very seasonal climate because we are at about 1,200 meters above sea level. Of course, the dry season is not as dry as in Laoland, but of course, there are three or four months with little amount of rain, and they can wait for the monsoon without any problem due to these sick leaves, in the same way as many orchids, for instance, of some ferns or so. So, uh, I'm surprised because I look more carefully at this Escinantis and what is very surprising is that we see two big vines on each side of the main vine. When I look more closely I see some indentations along the leaf. So it seems actually it's not at all an Escinantis but a member of Melastomataceae. So maybe it could be a Medinilla, an oppressed Medinilla. I did not know at all it could exist in India because I know some oppressed Medinilla in Madagascar, for instance. Oh yes, when we see these vines, it cannot be an Escalantus, it is a Melastomataceae. So, wow! So I have to check to know what could be this creature.
So here, we see something very similar to the previous uh, epiphytic species uh, with uh, thick leaves that are just a little bit longer, but when we see, when we can just cut a leaf, we see actually the milk, the latex, the white latex. So this is no doubt at all, this is an Hoya species. So there are very similar adaptations to this uh, quite dry seasonal environment in Melastomataceae, so through the small Medinilla, in Gesneriaceae with Eschinanthus, and in Asclepiadaceae with the Oya. So all are very similar. And if we don't see the flowers or the fruits, it's very difficult to know which family is this kind of plant. All the branches are totally covered by epiphytic species, so mostly belonging uh, to orchids, to ferns, uh, to Melastomataceae, with its here uh, strange uh, creeping thing, Escinantus, also Hoyas. All of them have quite small leaves, contrary to epiphyte species in much more regularly humid places, like, for instance, the Borneo or Peninsula Malaysia. Here, they have to face the dry season. But in spite of that, the diversity of the species is high and also the number of individuals is very high. Along the road, around Munar, we can see some patches of the original Shola forest. We see some old trees, which are remnants of the original forest trees. But all the medium-sized trees, the shrubs and the understory plants have been cut. So they have disappeared to plant the cardamom. So it's a kind of agroforest with cardamom but the understory is totally devoid of any other plant species. Some epiphytes are happy on the mossy trunk. We see a peperomia covering this branch. We see a cheflera germinating at the base of two branches. We see some ferns also, very often they are orchids. So it is quite strange because it seems that no regeneration of the trees is possible because we see no small trees. So what is the future of this kind of agroforest? It seems it's a little bit uncertain due to the fact that there are no small diameters of trees. When we see these uh, yellowish flowers, we see immediately it's a member of the TAC, the T family, so it's quite funny to see that this uh, huge tree, probably Schema Valichii, is remaining as an old tree of the Shola forest, whereas everywhere they have been cut to be replaced by the smaller, much smaller T, which is also the same family TAC, of course, it's a Camellia sinensis, so here you have the huge one. It's always a big surprise to see a tree which belongs to the daisy family, Asteraceae. And this uh, tree is a Vernonia, a tree Vernonia, Vernonia arborea. I'm not sure about the name, but I think it is Vernonia arborea. And we see 
the pink inflorescence, they are white when the capitulate flowers are not yet open and when they open we see all the pink structures. This yellow morning glory actually is a Meremia vitifolia, vitifolia because the leaves have the shape of the grape, vitis. On the rocks, in the middle of this small river, in the Munar area, we are at about 1,200 meters above sea level, we see this so beautiful impatient species with long leaves. It's a typical of the rheophytic species which have to withstand the very flash floods covering all the rocks and the stems are firmly fixed on the rock due to adventitious roots on much branch upwards. So we see this clump uh, firmly fixed to this quite small rock and actually when we look inside we see that the stems with the swollen nodes are fixed by the adventitious root to the rock and after they have the erect stems we see for instance an old stem which is a little bit brownish blackish and all the new erect stems arise at each node so it is possible for this plant to creep on totally to cover the rock firmly we see for instance this uh, one which is totally alone and we see clearly the stem on the mosses fixed on the mosses by the adventitious root system So we see here clearly the impatient flower, the, the this type of very flat flower and with the unequal petals of course which are characteristic of the genus Impatience but they are different shapes. This one is the 
very flat shape. And concerning the leaves, we see that they are actually in vertices by four, five or six. So it's a verticillate, erect species, but what is <laughs> incredibly beautiful is the bright orange flower. So due to this uh, growth habit, we see clearly that it's impatience due to the stem fixed firmly by adventitious root to the rocks is not at all an annual species. It is really a perennial species and it can withstand very strong flash floods in this fast flowing water thanks to its very narrow and long leaves which can survive in spite of very strong water current. So in the genus Impatience, actually, some species are annual. Many of the annual species are growing in the spray of waterfalls, which disappear totally in dry season. But also, many are really rheophytic species fixed to the rocks inside the fast-flowing rivers, sometimes in shaded habitats, like here, it's uh, the remnant of a shola forest, but sometimes also in more open areas. But this one with tall stems like this is a typical shade-loving species. So on this stem, we clearly see the branching pattern, which is almost continuous at each node. And we see that the lower nodes also are giving new axillary shoot and even the old part of the stem actually very firmly fixed by advantageous roots also have new arising stem. So we can understand how this plant is spreading all over the world. We see the beautiful light pink roots fixing the plant to the world with the mosses also covering the world. It's a mix of the Shola forest and the Shola grassland. We are at about 1,400 meters above sea level in the Matiketan Shola National Park. Small palm with a pinnate leaves is uh, obviously a phoenix, but it seems we see it only among the rocks in this uh, Shola grassland and I think it is adult because I see never type. Oh well yes and here I see old inflorescence it means it is an adult species and it has somewhat glaucous leaves totally folded at the base and it has the characteristic spines of phoenix species sharp spines. So all along the fissure in this uh, 
slab, it's a granitic rock. We say something dry which looks like a lichen, but actually it's not at all a lichen. It is a member of the Comelinaceae. So it's uh, either a Muradania or a Cyanotis, and it is able to perfectly withstand the dry season and the temperature because we can imagine, especially in two months in March or early April, it will be very, very hot. But anyway, it survives. The leaves are totally folded, so it is in some way revivescent and it will grow again from all the stem apices. It is much branched and it's one of the very few plants growing in this very harsh environment. This uh, small uh, Papillonaceae, Fabaceae, uh, with uh, three foliolate leaves, is probably related to Desmodium. Beautiful, more or less bullate uh, leaves, uh, which is not so usual in this type of uh, Papillonaceae. So this uh, is a shrub, has uh, bright uh, yellow flowers, which are no doubt at all a member of uh, Papillonaceae, the Fabaceae. It has almost uh, entire leaves, just uh, with uh, the stipules at the base, and it has totally inflated pots uh, emerging from the calyx. It's uh, quite strange because it is not at all in the center of the calyx that the pod is emerging. The upper side of the calyx, uh, not at all in the middle. It's uh, like two different structures. It, uh, it could be uh, the group of the Crotalaria, this group of uh, Papillonaceae. It is uh, a little bit shrubby. We can see this at the base. So uh, here in uh, this uh, grassland shola, uh, we see some rhododendrons. Uh, quite characteristic because uh, the stems are much more crowded. The leaves are smaller than the rhododendron we did see in the forest in uh, Dodabeta. It's about the same elevation because here now is uh, 1750. And here, probably due to the strong wind, the rhododendrons are much more branched This is a small plant with fern-like foliage. We can see clearly the fern-like foliage. And it has a long peduncle and the flowers, yellow flowers at the top is typical of the genus Biophytum. But this species is very small. This small bright yellow star flower is emerging from the soil, but there are no leaves at all. According to the shape of the petals, I think, I'm almost sure, it's a member of Hypoxidaceae, probably the, either the genus Hypoxis or the genus Curculigo, which is so well represented in Asia, but uh, probably the leaves will appear during the wet season. So now we arrive in the mossy forest because you are at 1,800 meters above sea level. So it's very humid. All the trees are covered by mosses. But here I see something 
very strange and beautiful. Actually, it is a piper, one of the many species of climbing piper, but this one is very special because it has bullet leaves and the leaves are oppressed to the mosses of the trunk, which is not usual in uh, this uh, piper in uh, India. I know one species in Malaysia, but this is very particular, so it's climbing. I don't know how is it at its face. Member of Acanthaceae, and actually they have all the same size, so probably it is one of these monocarpic species of Strobilantes, which have all the mass flowering in the same period, at least in one place. So here we see clearly that all the stems are the same height, the same size. It's an acanthaceae, it's a swollen knot, it is a strobilantes, so this is probably a monocarpic species of strobilantes because all are at the same age, and we know that according to a species, some are flowering every four years, some every 12 years, and uh, so probably this one, quite high, quite tall, will flower in a few months or maybe a few years. We see the same small piper with the climbing stem and we see that laterally it produces these branches totally detached with much longer oval shaped leaves and they are quite small and later the spadices, the inflorescence will be hanging and it's quite funny because just a few centimeters away we see another much more usual climbing Piper species in the Shola forest, which has much bigger leaves. Actually, the genus Piper is very well diversified in South India, especially the climbing species. Here along this mossy trunk, we see some erect stems without leaves, somewhat succulent. Maybe this could be epiphytic impatiens species because we know in this shola forest there are epiphytic species of impatiens and we know that now in dry season they lose the leaves and they keep only the succulent stems. So, here, <laughs> we see uh, a Tarzuliana, it's uh, one of the biggest I've seen, hanging from this tree to this tree. Impossible, of course, to know what could be. The stem is very particular, and uh, it's <laughs> obviously a very old individual.
This is a small shrub with uh, silvery leaves uh, covered with hairs and uh, with beautiful inflorescence. Uh, in fact, when I look, it's strange because when I look at the fruit, it really could be a member of Asteraceae with uh, the, these fruits covered by hairs, so floating in the air. But I'm surprised by this, the structure of the flowers, but it can be an Asteraceae or maybe a totally different family, but it can be an Asteraceae. And we clearly see on the side view the involucral bracts surrounding the terminal capitulate inflorescence. This is probably another species of strobilantes and probably monocarpic because we see that all the apical parts of the stems are flowering and we see absolutely no axillary branches without inflorescence. So when all the axillary stems are flowering, just as we can see here, for instance, even the small ones are flowering, so probably it is a monocarpic species. In a well-protected place and along the mossy trunk, this uh, procris has still many leaves at the end of the stems. It is uh, different from the species I know in uh, Southeast Asia. It has much longer leaves and venation is very well, very dense. And all the stems are growing from a unique base. This uh, epiphytic uh, uh, plant uh, is uh, actually a uh, member of the Lycopodium, now Phlegmariurus, but uh, anyway, it's uh, the epiphytic uh, Lycopodium and it has very thick and uh, large leaves, uh, which is not so usual for this epiphytic Lycopodium. And we see at the end of the stem the strobili, the hanging strobili with very narrow scale leaves. In this case, uh, it's uh, growing as a low epiphyte. We see the very thick leaves of uh, this Lycopodium. It's not usual at all in this uh, epiphytic Phlegmariurus. You can see the very thick, shiny leaves, perfectly adapted to resist to the dry periods. <laughs> this uh, small tree is a member of the Loraceae family. We see that it has more or less uh, crowded pseudo verticillate leaves and we see the branches arising from the same place here three here four we see it's a loracee especially when we look at the lower side of the leaf we see it is bluish so it is typical of the loracee it's like avocado leaves and here the young leaves are still totally soft and a little bit airy and after they will become erect. Loracea is a very important family in the mountains of Asia and here in this forest uh, in Kerala there are many Loracea species. It's a parasitic plant, a member of the Balanophoraceae and uh, we can see all the stages just emerging from the ground, totally protected by the involucral bracts. Here, a young inflorescence emerging from the bract, and here, a much more developed inflorescence, and even we can see the small white flower. 
Nicola Orstamens, I can see from here, emerging from the red calyx and the tube of the Corolla. Here we see a population of a Chlorantaceae and uh, we don't see the inflorescence, but here in South India it is mostly the genus Sarcandra and not the genus Chloranthus. It has uh, big leaves, uh, wide, uh, very green and very soft, contrary to, to many Chloranthus, uh, like uh, the common uh, Erectus. So it's a uh, Sarcandra, which uh, the normal size is like this. Uh, it's about uh, 1.5 meter tall. Uh, the Chloranthaceae is a very ancient, primitive family from uh, the Cretaceous time, uh, about uh, one. 130 million years ago. So this uh, big population of the Sarcandra, uh, I'm very surprised because when I look uh, at the inflorescences, it is very different from the species from the Sarcandra glabra that I know very well in Malaysia. And the purple erect structure is actually the flattened part of the stamen and the ovary is just at the base of this axis. So it's a very primitive flower with just one bract, one ovary and a long purple stamen opening in the center of the axis of the inflorescence. This inflorescence is a little bit more mature and we see the ovary which is bigger Already fecundation did occur. The decay of the stamen are inside. So it's uh, one of the most primitive type of angiosperm flowers we know living actually. Probably in the early Cretaceous time, uh, there were many other species like this. Dinosaurus did eat probably a lot of Chlorantaceae. Here we can see the fruits, the berry-like fruit, which will be turning purple-blackish when they will be totally ripe and they have only one seed inside. On the track of this trifle, we see a small species of impatience, but it has very butterfly-like a flower, a light pink flower, and very wide leaves. It's a very juicy, it's a probably an annual species growing on the old stem of the trifle. This orchid is a very bromeliad-like. It's a toric structure, funnel-shaped position of the leaves. So it's a very strange it's convergence between an orchid and the bromeliad from America. This uh, epiphytic uh, peperomia has the uh, leaves uh, verticillate uh, by four. It's uh, very nice because between each level of the four leaves there is a length of internode which is the same size as the leaves themselves so it allows the light to penetrate from one level to the second level to the third level and the uh, inflorescence, the spadix, is terminal.
another species of the Loracee family, and we see at the base of each branch uh, all the brown dry catafils which are protecting the bud. Still another species of Loracee which has much smaller leaves but always these flushes of young leaves growing old together. This uh, small Desmodium species with uh, bright orange flowers uh, actually has a very large distribution because exactly the same plant is also for instance in Peninsular Malaysia with the same color of flower and exactly the same shape of leaves and the same design with a silver design in the middle of each leaflet. So it's a uh, Strange to see in the southern Western Ghat the same species as in Peninsula Malaysia. Très belle fougère. Très long pétiole. Hein? Oui. This is a, an Ephole piece and this epiphytic fern is uh, quite surprising because it is totally green. It does not uh, lose or curl the fronds in the dry season. Uh, it keeps the front perfectly exposed. It's an Ephole piece. Uh, there are quite many species, of course. This one has very long and narrow pinules, so it is not one of the common species. Pinules are a little bit dentate, it's not so common in the Nephrolepis species. And we see the lines of white hydatodes just under the teeth. Lines of white hydatodes. This uh, huge epiphytic clump of the Lycopodium, of the Phlegmariorus, did fall from the tree and my great surprise is that I didn't think it was a fern, a revivescent fern, but actually it's a Selaginella. It's incredible to imagine a Selaginella epiphytic uh, at maybe 15 meters above the soil. It is revivescent, but obviously it's not a fern, it's a Selaginella. So, uh, first time I see 
and epiphytic Silaginella, strictly epiphytic and so high in the canopy. It is a revivescent Silaginella because it is uh, curled inward and after with the rain. But this in Silaginella, it's a quite common feature, but uh, usually for the rock dwelling species, but epiphyte like this. Uh, I didn't know one species in North America, but it is the most like hanging from the branches uh, close to the border of uh, Canada. But this is totally different. On the other side of the clump of the Lycopodium and Selaginella, we see the very, very dense root mat which was fixed to this branch. But what also is quite surprising, almost no humus, it's very thin. It's uh, maybe three or four millimeters thick. It's uh, exactly what I do with my vertical gardens when I put uh, a mat, uh, a fiber mat, which can have the water collecting in all directions. But here it's uh, only made of roots and stolons of the Selaginella. I try to install it on, uh, on the track in order to maybe to survive. Uh. The strobili, we did see them when they were hanging, when the plant was erect as an epiphyte, and the strobili were hanging down like this uh, from the upper part of the stem. So we can see all the small scales on these strobili. This is probably the same species of Selaginella, but growing also epiphytically, but on the lower part of the trunk. So, of course, it's uh, much more humid and it keeps the green fronds. On this very humid rock, close to a small water flowing on the rock, we see side by side two species of impatience. This one with a dark, uh, dark pink flower we had seen just before, and this one with many flowers on the inflorescence, which is very, very special because we see that the petals actually have lines. Uh, almost translucent lines uh, or dark lines. Uh, so it's an uh, absolutely perfect butterfly shape. Uh, these species both are probably annual because I see they are only very fleshy stems. Eh ben, un peu d'aventure.
we see these uh, small white flowers emerging about 10 centimeters above the water. They are not yet open. The leaves are not fair like water lily like, but probably it is a genus Nymphoides, which is a totally different family. It's not at all Nymphoidaceae, but it is a Gentianaceae. But I should like to see it open. I'm surprised by the size of the leaves. Usually Nymphoides have much smaller leaves. So we see this uh, the bright pink patches uh, of uh, flowers and uh, now it's early morning, they are fully open so I think it's uh, maybe a night flowering form of Nymphaea, probably Nymphaea lotus, uh, which is a widespread in uh, Africa and also in Asia. But this uh, red form, I don't know if it's uh, escaped uh, from culture or if it could be native. What is certain is that it is not planted in these backwaters, it is self-seeding and it remains very similar because all the patches have the same color of flowers. Climbing on this tree, we see the huge uh, inflated pots uh, of a uh, member of Papillonaceae, the Fabaceae, of course. And they are totally green. There are two lines, uh, and it's flat between the two lines. Uh, and after, they dry totally brown. I don't know if it's an annual species or uh, if it's a perennial, but it's uh, growing up to the top of the tree. I don't know if it can be used uh, for food, but I don't think there is too many things to eat inside this. The flowers, flowers, yeah, oh yes, one flower here. So it's a pink flower with a, on a long inflorescence. So strange, leguminose. The brown mature pots. Oh yes, with the seeds. Here is a big specimen of Otelia alismoides. It is a totally submerged species of the alismataceae and it is characterized by these cup-shaped leaves always partly folded upwards and it has only the flowers emerging above the water. It's a very variable species and it's a quite common in uh, standing waters of uh, Southeast Asia and Asia globally, tropical Asia of course.
now at 11 o'clock late morning, actually we see that all the flowers of the Nymphoides are fully open on the surface of the lake becomes like a snowy surface due to all of these flowers open side by side. And when we look in detail at the flower, we see the superb structure because each lobe of the corolla actually has filamentous emergences. It's a fimbriate corolla and it gives this very particular appearance of the flowers of all most of the species of Nymphoides. This one has a very long peduncle. It is well above the water level. Sometimes it's not so high. And in this species also the leaves are very big and very Nymphea-like. This morning, the bright pink nymphaea were fully open and I did suspect it was a light blooming form and we see that now, late morning at 11, they are totally closed. So it was a night blooming nymphaea. It's a, a, probably a hybrid of a nymphaea lotus. And uh, it's, uh, what's interesting is that it can reproduce itself exactly in the same color of the flowers and because obviously it's not planted so it, uh, it becomes naturalized here it's uh, better than the water yacinth eschornia which are everywhere Cabomba with a bright uh, pink flower and uh, the small leaves, oval leaves floating just before flowering and when we see the shape uh, we see it's uh, related to the Nymphaeus shape so it is of the water lily family before it was Cabombacé but now it's included in water lily. It's a very fragrant uh, white blooming orchid. I think it's uh, the one which is called the pigeon orchid. It's a uh, diagrobium, I don't remember, chromenatum or something like that. It has been installed on this tree, but uh, it is a native Asian species or maybe native of India also. In this uh, small uh, river, which uh, has been uh, totally managed, we see the walls uh, on each side. We see an incredibly huge population of Lagenandra. So it's a uh, close to Quaptocorine, but it's uh, different uh, according to the structure of the inflorescence and to the leaves, which are inward enfolded. Anyway, 
I think I've never seen the so dense population of aquatic plants emerging. It's a typical rheophytic species because we see it's growing in very fast flowing water. Now it's dry season, so we can imagine what happens when there are flash floods. This is probably the most common species, the Lagenandra ovata, and also the biggest species because some of the Lagenandra are much smaller. I'll try to approach because it seems there is a kind of stairs here. Actually, we see that uh, this uh, huge uh, Lagenandra is growing above the water, but it's also perfectly growing, totally submerged, with all the leaves floating in the current of the water. So we see really the rheophytic growth habit of uh, this species, which can grow both underwater and above water. It's not so common to see the same population, so individuals underwater and some emerge. I did try to see some inflorescence of fruit but I see nothing now it's not the right season. Here in the middle of the small stream, we see a patch of this Lagelandra which is totally submerged. And what is interesting is that we see that all the leaves were born underwater and the leaves are undulated along the margin of the blade. So it's characteristic of many rheophytic species. So we see clearly the two different forms of the leaves, two different shapes according if submerged or immersed. Ah, ah incredible, I've never seen this. <laughs> banks of this uh, river, we see another species of Nymphoides. It has brown leaves with small green dots also, or green lines, but mostly brown purple and very oval, very long, and the flowers are bright white, so the contrast between the brown leaves and the white flowers is perfect, and also the flowers are smaller than the species we did see in the backwaters of Kochi. So we clearly understand the, the structure of these Nymphoides, which is totally different from the Nymphaea. We see that actually at the base of the leaves, there are First, the part which is anchored in the soil, and from this part, the stem produces some leaves and all the flowers arising just at this place and successive flowers. So, it means that the inflorescence is lasting for a long time. And here we see the detail of the flowers, which are a little bit damaged. But this one is almost non fembriate at all, contrary to the other one from the backwaters. 
the venation of the leaf uh, is characteristic of the nymphoides and very different from the venation of the nymphaea leaves. White flowers, which are not the petals fimbriate, contrary to the other species, but we see also that each petal is a little bit pedunculate. It's lobes actually, it's not real petals, but the structure is beautiful, we see. In the middle of the lobe, there is a translucent crest, erect crest, perpendicular to the surface of the petal. And we see the flowers of the Samanea, which are typical flowers of Al Albizia. We can see clearly the two different adaptive strategies of epiphytes in this more or less seasonal climate in Kochi. We see the dry fronds of the Drenaria, so the fern, because Drenaria have two types of fronds. They have the erect fronds collecting humus and protecting the rhizome, and the hanging fronds, which are for both the sexuality with the sori and of course the photosynthesis because these are the green fronds and these green fronds during the monsoon season are drying out so it's totally different from the orchids because the orchids keep the leaves during the dry season but they have very thick leaves so retaining the water and also the hanging roots which can collect the night dew and also the small raindrops at different moments of the day. So two ways and also it can be also some annual species. Oh and I see also the ficus religiosa is installed on this Samanea. So even in dry season we can see different species growing on the Samanea. Two different ficus and the fern and orchids. Les grands ficus qui est là au-dessus, t'as vu en parasol, j'avais même pas vu. Pas le port qui en met la jeté. 
we see the characteristic leaf shape of a ficus religiosa with a so long acumen. We see also the convergence between the arms of the man and the roots of the ficus religiosa. Another American plant tree, the cannonball tree, which is sacred in many parts of Asia. And it has a characteristic flower appearing on stems totally specialized in flowering and arising directly from the trunk. It's a perfect case of cowley flory. And we see the structure of the flower, which is very special, clearly. The two types of stamens, uh, there are two discs, and we see some insects, of course, which are interested by maybe some nectar or pollen. On this uh, branch inflorescence, we see clearly the two types of stamens uh, on two discs. One disc with short stamens, yellowish, and one disc with uh, erect uh, elements uh, which are white then pink and uh, finally yellow on the anthers. I don't know if both stamens are fertile or if only one type of them is fertile. We clearly see that it produces the really a mass flowering of the coliflorus inflorescence at the same time at, as it is producing the new leaves because all these leaves are young now so it means that it produces the leaves at the beginning of the dry season it's a little bit surprising but uh, it is like this we clearly see that uh, there is a strong uh, total difference between the flowering part of the plant of the tree along the stems Coliflory and all the erect branches which bear only leaves and no inflorescence, no flowers at all, only leaves. This old wall, we see this plant with opposite leaves, dentate opposite leaves, and the terminal inflorescence. Uh, I think it has very succulent stem. It's a labier and maybe a plectrantus or a light genus. Uh, we have seen it also as epiphyte, but uh, really little fit and loving the old wall. I'm very surprised because under this uh, Samanea tree we see an epiphytic lycopodium, a phlegmariurus. And why I'm surprised because usually this lycopodium 
are only able to grow in very humid climate, almost permanently humid. And here, we are in a city, so everybody knows that the climate of a city is much more contrasted than around. But in spite of that, this uh, epiphytic lycopodium is perfectly growing. la transparence This uh, ficus uh, bengalensis is a great souvenir for me. We are in Bombay, we are in Kolaba, the old part of Bombay, just uh, in front of the gate of India. And this is the Kalimpong Art House. And why is it a great souvenir? Because the first time we came in India, it was uh, 20 years ago. It was at the end of 2002. And it was a young ficus bengalensis growing here and hopefully nobody did cut this ficus bengalensis so the few roots appearing at the beginning just on the old beautiful gate of this Kalimpong art house now is a big ficus a big individual and they did never cut it and actually the the structure of the gate is not truly really perturbated by the roots. The roots are enveloping but not going inside. So we are at the central part of uh, Bombay and we can see some evolutionary ways of uh, plants in uh, during 20 years in this place. Because now is February 2023, so it's uh, more than 20 years after the first time.
we see the Ficus Bengalensis totally enclosing the grids. The roots are totally enclosing the grids, the metallic grids. Also, the wall made of concrete and stones. A living, living thing, embracing all the structures. Is this a ficus? Eh? It's a ficus, of course, a coliflorus ficus. I don't know which species. Of course, it's not a bangalensis or a, one of the common. You see, it's a quite a huge leaf, actually. <laughs> Folialtia cinculogifolia, but it's a, it's a form cultivated with long hanging branches. It's called Ashoka tree, and uh, it's very characteristic uh, of an uh, Indian cultivated tree and uh, a little bit sacred. On the road, a uh, very old and huge uh, frangipane, white flowered frangipane tree. Very beautiful long leaves. Longifolia is a good name. Good species name. This is Turnera? Yes, it's Turnera. The flowers now, it's late afternoon, are faded. And, but uh, what is particular with the Turnera, we can see here, is that the flower appears directly on the petiole of the leaf. It means that the flower peduncle is adenate to the petiole of the leaf. And with two bracts here. I'm surprised because it's one. Yes, it becomes, oh yes, it becomes a shrub. Not at all annual, it becomes a woody shrub. So many plants in this uh, old building are installed. Of course, there are different ficus, ficus religiosa, ficus bangalensis, and also the fern, uh, the pteris vitata, <laughs> which is growing everywhere in the fissures of the walls as soon as there is a little bit humidity. Of course, everybody is happy along the gutters, the vertical gutters, both the ficus and the ferns because they can collect some water due to the fact that usually the gutter, vertical gutters are not at all waterproof, hopefully for this plant. But you see the biggest ficus is installed simply on a fence, on a wooden fence.
जिंदगी एक सफर है सुहाना यहाँ कल गया हो किसने जाना जिंदगी एक सफर है सुहाना यहाँ कल क्या हो किसने जाना हरी वो नहीं वो नहीं वो वो नहीं वो नहीं वो वो नहीं वो नहीं वो वो नहीं वो वो नहीं वो नहीं वो वो नहीं वो नहीं वो वो नहीं वो नहीं वो चंद तारों से चलना है आगे आसमानों से पढ़ना है आगे हर चांद तारों से चलना है आगे आसमानों से पढ़ना है आगे पीछे रह जाएगा ये जमाना यहाँ कल क्या हो किसने जाना जिंदगी एक सफर है सुहाना यहाँ कल क्या हो किसने जाना हरी वो नहीं वो नहीं वो वो नहीं वो नहीं वो वो नहीं वो नहीं वो वो नहीं वो वो नहीं वो नहीं वो हरी वो नहीं वो नहीं वो एक दिन ऐसी बातों से क्या घबराना यहाँ कल क्या हो किसने जाना जिंदगी एक सफर है सुहाना यहाँ कल क्या हो किसने जाना 